Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India continue on our discussion on the Harappan sites and uh, their material culture and here from the terracotta we have also found that I mean there are some of the other materials who have been uh, really important and that gives us a sense of different kind of material practices. So from bricks from the terracotta figurines we have also found there have been used this uh, soapstone or steatite. So soapstone is a material which is soft and it is a it is very much like talc and uh, it is a very soft material when it is carved and then once it is uh, treated with water and then it becomes hard and it is also the material we, we have also found in some of the Hoysala uh, temples in the much later time period. However, there are some of the soapstone sculptures that we find from the Harappan sites, from the Indus Valley sites and those are the ones which are of high importance. So the one we have on screen, this is uh, considered to be this priest king and I will come into this um, into its iconography but before that I mean just a small thing about its process. So it has been considered that I mean it is not just, uh, it is not just uh, made with the soapstone and then treated with water for its hardness but it is also low fired. So perhaps it not, it has not been fired as the terracotta figures or the bricks but I mean it has also been low fired for its stability and that is how we see that today this sculpture the way it appears they, it appears almost like almost stable as stone and perhaps also that is the reason all these details and everything on this particular sculpture had survived for its durability. So what we see on this sculpture it is a bust of a man. And in this particular sculpture what we find that I mean there is, uh, there is very individualistic characteristics those are depicted in this figure. So for example, we have these wide cuts for this, uh, for the eyes which might, might show that I mean this particular figure is, uh, has half closed eyes. So the half closed eyes in the later times we will find that I mean how that had also been part of the yogic practices and that is also something that we find to be uh, in the profusely used as part of the depiction of Hindu gods and goddesses and that is how some of the connection had been made. Perhaps those are also some of the things why this figure is related to a priest and uh, so the half closed eyes in brief we can say that the half closed eyes in the um, in the Hindu and in the Buddhist depiction we find that, that has um, much closer relationship with spirituality and that is the reason the half closed eyes of this male figure had also been equated with uh, perhaps a, a priest or someone who is a spiritual practitioner. Now apart from those wide eyes that, that we find half closed wide eyes, we also have a straight nose of this figure that also adds the individual characteristic and then we have high cheekbones and then wide lips. So wide lips are something those are considered to be part of the overall you know the population in this region in the South Asia as well as like I mean uh, part of in Southeast Asia and in the uh, Northern Africa and so on where like I mean the, the wide lips are been prominent in uh, many of the people. So it had been considered that whether that is a kind of connection that is made or it is also something that was a choice by the uh, people who had created these images. So apart from this wide lips then this straight nose, this eyes, we also see there is a very strong suggestion of the beard and the beard that we have here, it is uh, simplistic in some ways at the same time it is also clever that 
we have the mustache and the beard that that continues in its uh, in this uh, man's cheeks and the beard the area of the beard had been very strongly or like prominently distinguished from the skin and that is how we find this this line that sort of runs on his face that separates his skin from the beard and the beard then is represented by those straight um, vertical lines which run parallelly with each other. So, those are the lines uh, that, that we know as to be like simplistic depiction of the hair and of course that I mean that we, we find a reflection of that hair um, uh, of the beard in the priest king's head as well. So, in the head we find that I mean he also has a headband not a headdress but a headband and that also perhaps held a jewel in its forehead that is the reason there is this circular shape that um, you know that suggest uh, you know uh, perhaps uh, there is something much more uh, precious or prominent that that had been featured in this particular um, you know in this ornament and then the image from its back or like i mean the the three quarter view in the right side of the screen we find that i mean how this headband that that we have in the front image that that is been tied in the back so all those details of its hair of this person's hair and then like i mean this the hair which is parted in the middle and then all the hairline that is uh, you know that is suggested with this uh, vertical um, parallel lines very similar to that of the beard and then what we have is this how this headband is tied at the back of his head and the ribbons dangling uh, behind his shoulder. So, this is something that we find that this, this eye for precision, the eye for details, um, a tendency that we find in the bull, uh, the, the bull uh, seal that we have already studied earlier and some of the other sculptures. So, this also tells us that I mean perhaps the craft specialization that had already been there, there were group of sculptors, there were group of um, you know artisans who were specialized in doing this kind of details and they have uh, left no detail in the in the whatever they are depicting. So, uh, those things are there, but at the same time we also find that there are much more simplistic um, depiction of the human bodies. For example, the terracotta figurines that we have studied and their peculiarity in terms of how the vertical clay strips were put together for making them. So, this kind of different attributes and um, characteristic features that we find in these images, they, they tell us about the breadth of the material culture in this region during the Indus Valley period that is 2600 BC to 1900 BC, the matured phase. So, Apart from these details, what we also find is that I mean we have this the uh, elaborate depiction of the fabric. So, fabric is also another very important area for us to consider that uh, what we have here is this I mean this this priest king or this man he has his one shoulder bare and then his left shoulder is adorned with this uh, piece of fabric which sort of covers his body. So, in the image from the front that only shows that I mean part of this uh, part of this uh, sculpted uh, fabric and the image from the back that shows that I mean how it had uh, you know it, it almost covers the entire part of his back. So, what we also see in this fabric is that how the motifs that, that appear on the fabric they appear to be three petaled flowers or leaves they have been repeated all along in this entire fabric. So, it might also suggest that I mean there had been um, the practices of doing repetitive motifs on the fabrics and as I have already mentioned it earlier that uh, this region was very much active in inter-regional as well as um, you know uh, that uh, the trade which is not really within uh, within this region, but I mean uh, outside of that and uh, both like intra and inter-regional trade was active in this region. So, 
that suggests, I mean, and we also have found some of those um, textile fragments from Egypt, which seems that, I mean, those are the ones which were um, imported from the Harappan sites that suggest that, I mean, there had already been use of pigments on the fabric and there might have been use of some kind of blocks or repetitive techniques of uh, adorning textiles. So, those are some of the things that also make us think that how uh, fabric was also a diversified practice during this time. And since fabric was also the textile or fabric that is also something that is very much part of this trade exchanges and uh, cultural as well as economic currency, that is the reason perhaps the sculptor here had also made so much details of this fabric to adorn the body of this priest king. So, if this material was of no importance, they might have not put so much importance in depicting all the details here. Now, coming back to why this particular sculpture is considered to be a priest king. So, we do not really have this kind of individual depiction of a figure that I mean what we consider to be like a royal figure from this sides. And that is also one of the reasons why there had been the speculations that there was no king as such in these places, but there were those governing bodies. So, if this is the truth then we can also think that I mean there this this person can also be someone who was of high social stature, but we do not really know whether this is a ruler or this is a spiritual leader. And as I have already mentioned it before that I mean with this half closed eyes with its a prominent beard and so on those things resemble the later depiction of the priests and the spiritual practitioners, which led the archaeologists, historians and art historians to assume that, I mean, this might have been a priest. And since like, I mean, you know, with its, with its uh, very prominent uh, display of jewelry and this very intricately detailed uh, fabric that sort of adorns its body. Those also gives us a sense that I mean perhaps this person was of high social stature, not as a priest, but as a king or a ruler. And that is the reason this particular figure is um, considered to be somewhere in between a priest and a king, but it remains unresolved whether um, you know whether this, this figure is actually either of them or something else. Then we also have some of the other images and this is one of the images that we found and this is from the 3rd millennium BC that is 2700 BC and uh, that is what we have on screen is a, is a man and this man we find it is a, it's a small seated male figurine and we, which has a cobra umbrella behind him. So, that, that suggests that I mean this particular figure that, that we have here, it, it also might have carried some uh, importance and what we have here on the on, on this image. So, this is a crudely made um, image and this, this image ha also has like I mean very uh, you know minimal details. And with whatever details we find in this particular figure that we have that I mean this man is seated um, and then I mean uh, with his hands resting over his knees. And then what he also has is that there is this uh, hooded the snake and that, that is that, that makes an umbrella over his head. So, there might have been uh, those, those seven, uh, it, it might have been a seven hooded snake in its entirety, but now I mean parts of the snake had been broken. However, when we see that I mean there is a suggestion of this snake that is broken and uh, you know and which, which also creates a kind of canopy behind someone's head that already gives a kind of supernatural uh, connection to it. And it, it can be that I mean this kind of snakes were imagined and they were uh, made as part of the royal seat or the seat where the governing bodies would sit there 
for for during during their governance so but it can also be a metaphoric representation we do not know what kind of significance it held however the other details that we find in this figure they are fairly simple so for example those clay additional clay strips perhaps been added for making the necklace on this uh, figure as well as the um, the jewelry on its upper arm and the small bracelets and at the same time we find that i mean there are some suggestions of the eyes those have been made here and for making the eyes we see that i mean grooves were created and then like i mean the 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 section where the eyes are made so very very uh, minimal but i mean effective uh, strokes those those are created there for suggesting that how the uh, the human eyes are there and then there is also a suggestion of uh, nose and then just like one tiny uh, suggestion of lip so all these things are there and in the body we find that there is uh, perhaps uh, you know there is something that runs from his uh, left shoulder to the uh, to the right and which which uh, seems like i mean you know it can be part of an ornament it can also be part of a fabric or we do not know that i mean what what it is however that i mean there is also something we find that there is some suggestion of pigment and there is also some suggestion of um the this this red and white pigment in this figure which shows that i mean th after this figure was created it was painted with this pigments and uh, the painting them with particular pigments and having this kind of um you know adornment that also suggests something about their importance so they are not as bland as the 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 other male figurines that we have found the standing ones which are found in uh, quantity but these are the some of the rare figurines that we have found which which also it does not really follow the same kind of um you know the the making principle for example two vertical clay strips are not joined in this case but they come to represent perhaps some kind of important uh, figures in in their context now from there we also come to talk about some of the other things that that we have from this indus valley sites and that is to do with this particular one figure and this is one of the very few surviving um, icons that we have from the indus valley that shows the high craftsmanship in terms of the use of bronze now the question can come that i mean if we are talking about clay if we are talking about terracotta and so on then why the, we can connect it to the bronze but in this figure perhaps we do not really see the use of clay but clay was indirectly used in it so this this particular figure that we have on screen which is considered to be this dancing woman or a woman who is standing with her one hand in it, in her waist so this is a particular figure that we have it's a tiny figure but it 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 is of high importance because um because of its technique and its sophistication in its making so this particular figure that we have on screen this one is actually something that is considered uh, to be uh, you know made from this lost wax process and lost wax process is something that is in which the wax models are created first so we have the wax that is uh, melted and then that is shaped um, according to the artisan's desire and then like i mean the additional details for example the the bangles that we have on her hand or then like i mean you know the necklace and then the adornment in the hair and so on all those things that we have here those are perhaps been added with extra strips of wax and then once the entire figure is made then it is uh, sort of like i mean put in this mold made of uh, clay and uh, in today's time we have the use of plaster of paris and different kind of other materials which can which can be used for making the mold but during those time as we can understand in the you know in the second and the third millennium bc uh, this kind of materials like plaster of paris and so on were certainly not available so the only available material was clay for making the mold of this wax model and then what happens in those clay molds there are several kind of several channels are created 
and then when it is put on a uh, you know when it is heated then this this wax uh, this figure uh, then the the wax actually melts away and it goes by those channels which are created in this uh, in in the mold and then with the heat the mud also becomes firm and thus like I mean the terracotta molds are created. So, when the terracotta molds are created then the terracotta molds are also used for metal casting and that is how the bronze casting as we can see here this very sophisticated bronze casting had been taken place. So, terracotta or clay here again plays an integral part in shaping this kind of bronze casting that we uh, see in the Harappan context. So, this kind of different activities as we can find that I mean how this this bronze casting was implemented and that that shows that I mean this different range of uh, you know practices material handling and different kind of techniques and so on they were very efficiently handled by the artisans in this area. And another thing that I mean we can also think about the use of the bangles because in this particular figure we have that I mean the woman figure which is um, you know which is depicted here. So, she has a very uh, tall and slender um, you know um, body and in this one we have like I mean very minimal suggestion of her breast as well as her genitals. And then the other thing that we find is that I mean her hands they seem to be slightly exaggerated and th that can also be uh, you know that can also be interpreted that I mean how those hands are uh, you know made as, as, as part of like I mean supporting the entire structure. So, that is that is perhaps the reason the hands are given much more prominence uh, than uh, the other parts of the body. And in the face we also have this this very half closed eyes and the, to be specific like I mean slightly a flat nose and this wide lips and then there is a suggestion of a hairdo in its back. So, all these different things are there however, in the, the left hand in the left arm we find that I mean there are those bangles which adorn her uh, right uh, which adorn her upper arm as well as the lower arm. So, these are some of the things that, uh, that, that make us think about the use of the bangles something that we have also seen in the Pashupati seal or that yogi seal right that the seal which was um, either been uh, considered to be a seal of a yogic figure or with the with uh, Pashupati. So, this this kind of like the use of the bangles it might also mean that there were some kind of practices which were common to um, you know for the for the both the male and the female members of the society and thus it also puts a question to different kind of gendered use of ornaments and adornments the way we understand them today perhaps it was very different by then. The other thing that we also find very interesting in this particular bronze figurine is that the balance. This figure is very uh, you know carefully balanced and that is that is something we find that I mean the, the head of the figure is slightly raised it is not looking straight, but it is slightly raised and then like I mean as we can see that the right arm that supports uh, her waist and then the left arm sort of dangles over her thigh and then like I mean her left leg is slightly raised whereas her right uh, leg is like I mean firmly placed on the ground similar to like the contrapposto pose that we find in the west in much later times. Now, the thing is that this is also a pose that we find in the later times in the various Indian sculptures and so on because in the Indian sculptures in the Indian paintings and in the visual arts in general there had been a high significance of different kind of shapes and uh, different kind of bodily gestures. So, the, the gestures we will find them later on to be connected to various dance forms and in the sculptures profusely different kind of this gestures are used and in some of the forms for example, if we think about some of the later terms which are used in Sanskrit for uh, Samavanga and then Atibhanga. Trivanga and so on. So, here we find perhaps this tri body bent or Trivanga that is depicted in this figure efficiently. So, and that is depicted by this slightly raise of the head here and then 
how there is this bend that is uh, punctuated by the her the right arm supporting her waist and then the uh, uh, left leg slightly raised so like i mean there are those three bends in this entire body that had been created and that is something that that we consider to be to be part of this entire idea of this tri body bent or trivanga for those reasons we find this particular this very tiny figurine that is made of bronze to be of high importance that it not only just talks about the material advances the people have made during this time but they have also taken this practices much further and um, that is that is to do with the, their um, you know the the significances the various symbols they have used for example the use of the bangles if that had something to do with the gendered practices or not and then also this this fine sense of balance that had been um, implemented in this particular sculpture or this uh, you know this this figurine if i can call it so these are these are the different aspects of it which makes us think about its high significance in um, you know in indian art now this particular technique even though it's much in later times but we find that i mean this similar kind of technique that had also been um, continuing in uh, you know in parts of southern india for example if we see the bronze casting in swami malai in tamil nadu and that at least from the chola period in the 9th century that kind of bronze casting had been continuing so there we find a very similar kind of practice or the process where the figures are uh, made of wax and then this wax modeled figures and then may uh, you know put into make this molds and then those molds are been uh, used for the bronze casting so this is this is something that we find that i mean a practice which had started during this harappan period we do not have other evidences to relate it directly to the chola bronze making practice or the other bronze making practices in other part of the subcontinent but there are some of this fragments of them we can see them being implemented and thus we can also imagine that how some of this related practices have evolved over time those are some of the things we also find to be uh, you know uh, related to some of the other practices in the indus valley sites for example the way the beads are uh, utilized so while making the bronze sculptures while making this the use of uh, metals we see that i mean they have also been mastered the use of different kind of metallic tools and the metallic tools involve like polishing making shaping different kind of stones and um, bones and different kind of hard material to make them in form of beads so that is also something that we find to be very much prominent in the bead sculptures and the bead um, you know the ornaments those are there in the you know in this in this uh, found from the harappan sites so and this is also uh, as as we can see on screen that i mean there is this very sophisticated uh, bead necklace that we have here and this this bead necklace that actually has used some semi precious stones and some other stones which are which are made uh, um, you know which are which are all standardized so it also gives us uh, some kind of, some suggestions that i mean there might have been uh, tools for doing this kind of standardized practice so uh, this kind of like i mean tools which are mostly made of uh, metals and then before that as we have already spoken about the use of metals for casting and so on so both for making things as well as for um, you know for for using metal for doing the objects so for tools as well as the material for making the objects in both ways we see that i mean metal was also um, you know utilized alongside uh, their their fondness for clay and terracotta thank you